translating the Bible often involves sorting out what the original manuscripts said. And this field of scientific study is called textual criticism. It's an unfortunate name, but it's what we're stuck with. We're not criticizing the Bible, but rather trying to be faithful to what the original authors wrote by looking closely at the evidence, sort of like detectives trying to recreate the scene of a crime. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Peter Gurry about New Testament textual criticism. But before that, I'd like to play a very helpful introduction to it by Daniel Wallace from a public talk he posted on YouTube. So let's listen to that and then dive into a fascinating conversation with Dr. Gurry about myths and mistakes in New Testament textual criticism. And by the way, the audio on our call starts out a little rough, but it gets way better after a bit. Once again, I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. The definition of textual criticism historically has also been the goal of textual criticism. It is simply to try to ascertain the wording of the original text of a particular document when that original document no longer exists. Now, that goal has been nuanced in recent years, and there's been a second goal that some have wanted to make into the primary goal of textual criticism, but let me uh, address those issues. When it comes to New Testament textual criticism, the primary goal and the basic definition is to try to determine the wording of the original text of the New Testament because the original text no longer exists. If the original text of a document still existed, textual criticism would not be necessary. If all the copies of a document still exist, even though the original doesn't, and all those copies are exactly like each other, then textual criticism really would not be possible. So with New Testament textual criticism, our objective is to try to examine these copies to get back to that original wording. In recent years, textual criticism has been redefined, or at least New Testament textual criticism has been redefined. The goal used to be simply to try to recover the wording of the original text. But in recent years, the definition has become, let's find out what different scribes over the centuries have, ch how they've changed the text, and what those changes indicate about their socioeconomic, cultural uh, situation, their religious uh, background, their poli uh, politics, this kind of thing. Now, that should not be the primary goal of textual criticism, but it has a very important role in the process of understanding the transmission of the text. And it also is a goal that should tell us, if I can find out what influence to scribe to change the wording to X from Y, then that tells me that X is not the original reading, but it came from Y. Now, in terms of the definition that uh, uh, most textual critics follow of trying to determine the wording of the original text, there has also been, in recent years, uh, an, a new wrestling with how we define the term original. And there have been some issues that we need to think about. One of these issues is, is an original text the text that an author uh, initially wrote, but may have then fine-tuned it later on? Which one of those counts as the original text? That's a great question. When Shakespeare did his plays at the Globe in London, for example, he would fine-tune them, he would tweak them, the wording would change from play to play. Uh, when Mozart was doing his uh, concerts and his operas uh, in uh, uh, Vienna, then he would also be taking it through various changes. The fact is that if scholars were to find duplicate copies or more than one handwritten copy of uh, Shakespeare's plays or Mozart's operas, which one would be considered the original? It's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. It's a tough question. So one scholar raised these illustrations and said the New Testament seems to be the sort of a document that is not capable of being able to define what the original text is. Another scholar pointed out that we need to have uh, different ideas of what an original text is. And what he ultimately landed on, I think, is the best definition, although I'm not so sure he felt it was the best definition was the, what's called, what the Germans call the Ausgangstext. That means it's the text that exited from the author as it was dispatched to the readers. 
and uh, this is also sometimes known as the autographic text or the autographs. I think that's the best definition of an original text when it comes to the New Testament documents. And so the issue here is this. When an author writes something and then sends it to readers who are in a different location, as soon as it leaves that author's hands, now we're dealing with that document which is finalized as far as he's concerned, and consequently that's what we would call the original text or uh, more exactly the autographic or Ausgangs text. We'll use those terms interchangeably in this uh, introduction to textual criticism, however, and that's the text that we are talking about. When we say original, it's what leaves the author's hands when it's dispatched to the readers in some other region. Textual criticism is necessary for the New Testament documents, just as it is necessary for virtually every scrap of ancient uh, Greco-Roman literature for two reasons. First of all, we don't have the autographic or the original text anymore. And secondly, no two manuscripts agree completely. Well, the reason no two manuscripts agree completely is because all these manuscripts, by definition, were written by hand. There was no movable type printing press until the year 1454, when Johann Gutenberg in the city of Mainz, Germany, actually invented the, uh, the machine that could do this, and it uh, was one of the greatest invention uh, one of the greatest inventions of the last millennium. Uh, it happened a year after the Turks invaded Byzantium on May 29th, 1453, which will become a significant point for us as we think through some of the issues of the transmission of the New Testament as well. So within a, a, a two-year period, 1953, 1954, two very significant events took place that affect uh, New Testament textual criticism. But as I was saying, up until that time, we didn't have manuscripts printed on a printing press. They were all handwritten. And because they were all handwritten, every single one of them has mistakes in it. Now, most of the changes that these manuscripts have are very, very trivial. Spelling differences, for example, are among the most common, and largely because there was no standardized spelling of so many words in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, what's fascinating is, in, it, within the space of eight verses in one chapter, in the Gospel of John, the author spells the exact same word. It's a, for those of you who know Greek, it's a third-person singular, aorist, active, indicative of anoigo. The word means I open. He spells it three different ways in, within the space of eight verses. Now, that's remarkable that we could have that kind of variety of spelling, but there weren't dictionaries that said there's a right way to spell, there's a wrong way to spell in these words. When it comes to the New Testament manuscripts, not only are no two uh, manuscripts exactly alike, but th as you look at the earlier documents, two of the closest manuscripts of the ancient world, when we're talking about first millennium, even we're talking about the first half millennium, the first 500 years A.D., now we're talking about manuscripts that differ even those that are as close to each other as we can find, between six and ten times per chapter. Well, there's about 250 chapters for the whole New Testament, so if those manuscripts were complete New Testaments, we're talking about a couple thousand differences for those documents for the spread of the New Testament. Because we don't have the autographs anymore, because the manuscripts differ from each other, and because they differ at times quite a bit. At other times, it's still minimally six to ten times per chapter of the early and important witnesses. We have to practice the discipline of textual criticism to try to get back to the original. Ultimately, the objective, as we examine all these manuscripts and think about the data, is to try to sift through and find out what kinds of variants or textual changes were created either accidentally or created intentionally as a change to some other form of the text than what the authors originally wrote. And we'll wrestle with those issues as we get into uh, this discipline a little bit more. Today we have an exciting special guest. His name is Peter Gurry, Dr. Peter Gurry, who graduated from the University of Cambridge and has now joined the Phoenix Seminary faculty in 2017. And he teaches courses in the Greek language and New Testament literature. And he has a lot of interests in research from Greek grammar, the history and formation of the Bible, 
and the history of New Testament scholarship. So welcome, Peter. Thanks. It's great to be here, Andrew. Yeah. He's also presented his work at the Society of Biblical Literature, ETS, and the British New Testament Conference, among others. And he and his wife are members at Witten Avenue Bible Church. And he is known to enjoy cheap, fast food, good typography, and Jack London stories. So, I mean, what else do you want? true. (laughs) (laughs) All true. I, I have a feeling I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like this guy because he enjoys cheap fast food. So <laughs> we, we share that in common at least. So yes. yeah, what's your favorite? Uh, my personal favorite is Wendy's. Okay. But I like a good, good Chick-fil-A as well. Oh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Although Raising I Kings? worked at Chick-fil-A and we you don't didn't? consider it fast food. Fast food. That's, that's right. fair. I mean, that's yeah. fair. I'll, I can accept that. It's, but it's but I, I would say that technically, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fast. It's definitely mm-hmm. fast. It's definitely fast. Well, yeah. It's good. Whenever I want to celebrate like uh, publishing a book or something, I'll head over to Burger King and get oh, like okay. two yeah. Whopper Juniors. Oh, wow. Yeah. And take them home and then add my own cheese to them. Oh, so, why your own? Don't they, can't they put cheese on it? It's just too expensive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're like my dad. When I was a kid, we would go to McDonald's and get hamburgers and go home and we'd put cheese on them. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I love Burger King, but Chick-fil-A pretty awesome too. So, okay. Well, now that we got the important stuff out of the way, um, uh, you're in Phoenix and, uh, did you, are you from Phoenix? No, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. I've only been in Phoenix for about four years and came here to teach. How are you handling the, the culture shock? Uh, the heat is a struggle, especially about this time of the year. Late yeah. August is when you're, you're ready to, uh, to move away because it's so yep. hot. Yep. Um, but you know, the, the, the amazing thing about Arizona that surprised me is the really significant differences in, in climate and geography. So yeah. we live in the Valley in Phoenix and it's, you know, desert but you can drive two hours north of us and be in Flagstaff and in the winter you can be skiing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Crazy. So that's kind of incredible to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, such an interesting area of the U S so mm-hmm. different. It really is. And it's mm-hmm. just so, it, you know, so many, so much of it is so panoramic and just beautiful places. Right. Like Sedona, and then, there's a place if if you go two hours the other direction from Sedona, you're up on the what's they call the Mogollon Rim here, which yeah. is very wooded and it's it's usually yeah. about twenty to twenty five degrees cooler than it is here in Phoenix. Nice, nice. So it's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I have a very fond memory of Arizona. Uh, my pastoral ministry teacher told us a true story about a student of his who who was called by a church out in Arizona. Uh huh. And after a while, after being there, I don't know how long, the elders got together and sat him down and they said, sorry, sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. Um, and he said, why? He, they said, well, you served the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning. And he said, okay. And they were like, it's the Lord's Supper, not the Lord's breakfast. <laughs> it's not a joke. It, this actually happened. <laughs> wow. So anyway, when I think of Arizona, I, I think of that you story. Think of I thought that? you would appreciate. I don't know if you were on the elder board when that happened. I was not. No, I had, not, had nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with that. That is yeah. something, though. Um, thanks for being here. And just so you know, you know, I edit these and post these interviews. So if you just happen to let a, a bad word slip, you know, I can bleep it out. You never know with these seminary professors. That's true. When I had John Mead on here, man, you can imagine. I just had to like do some <laughs> hardcore editing after that I bet. one. I bet. <laughs> uh, let's get started. We are here to mainly discuss your new book, which is called Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism, Mm -hmm. which has a lot to do with Bible translation, obviously. And uh, this is published by IVP. And you've also published a few other books. Um, I'll link those in the description. A New Approach to Textual Criticism, an Introduction to the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method. So if anybody wants to grab a copy of that for their wife for Christmas, it's a good one. (laughs) 
But we want to talk about the new one, which you were an editor on with uh, a guy named Elijah Hickson, right? Is he over, where does he teach? He currently, he just, he just returned from uh, the UK where he was working for Tyndale House in Cambridge. Nice. Uh, helping them edit their Great New Testament. And he's just recently moved back to the US and taken up a job with the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. That must be there. fun. Yeah. yeah. So what, what made you fall in love with textual criticism? Let's start with that. Yeah, so I, um, I first kind of fell in love with Greek because I was able to hmm. uh, take Greek in high school, which is pretty unusual these days. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't just, it wasn't classical Greek. It actually was Koine Greek. And nice. uh, we were, I can remember the third, I think second or third year I was taking it, we got our Greek New Testaments. And uh, that was amazing to me. I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world that I was very slowly, but and painstakingly reading. I think we were doing first John at the time and realizing that that was what was behind my English Bible. And yeah. so I was really fascinated by that, that there was this thing behind my English Bible. I'd never really even thought about it as a kid growing up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like too many first year, second year Greek students, I was trying to correct my NIV English, English translation, you know, with my, <laughs> two years of Greek knowledge, <laughs> but I was just, you know, it was fascinating to, to get behind my English Bible. And then when I got to Bible college, uh, that kind of just t- took that the next step further when we learned about text criticism in Greek class there. And it was kind of like that next step further back. So mm-hmm. I got behind my English Bible to my Greek New Testament, but then I realized that printed Greek New Testament I had, there were things behind that too. Nice. And so I've ever since just been fascinated by that process of how we go from you know, hundreds and hundreds of handwritten Greek manuscripts to a printed, you know, all all the way to the printed English Bible in my Mm -hmm. case, because, you know, it's my native language, but whatever, whatever your native language is, if you have the Bible in your language, that process of getting from manuscript to translation has always fascinated me. Cool. Well, your book is an extraordinary breath of fresh air with its attention to detail and specificity and winsome honesty. So just let me say that. Thank you. And what are some of the things that lit a fire under you to make that book happen? Yeah, so the main, the main, the main fire was my co-editor, Elijah Hickson, okay. <laughs> who, who spurred me on to do it with him. Cool. Um, but both of, us, both of us thought it was a good idea because we were in PhD programs at the time. Both of us were working in text criticism, Mm -hmm. and both of us are uh, committed evangelicals, and we were troubled by the amount of misinformation we kept seeing in apologetic literature on the subject. So because of of the popularity of Bart Ehrman and his work popularizing text criticism and criticizing an evangelical view of scripture, Mm -hmm. evangelical apologists, this has become kind of uh, a necessary element in their repertoire, you know, have to discuss text criticism. Uh, these days, whether they know much about it or not. And so what we found was happening was a lot of old arguments were just getting rehashed over and over again. Yeah. At times, the, if I can call it a transmission process, was uh, things were getting lost in that process. Yeah. And arguments that maybe were good back in the 1940s when F.F. Bruce first made them were both out of date and then being misused. So it was a combination of seeing the kind of mistakes that were being made and then seeing them get made over and over and over again. And then the added element to that was in the worst case scenario, they were bad arguments, but they were presented as kind of gotchas, you know, yeah. like yeah. people criticize the reliability of the Bible. Well, look at this, look at all these manuscripts we have. And so you'd have to be crazy to think we couldn't trust the new Testament text while the information they're giving to dis- defend that was actually bogus or just really inflated, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So it was, it was making us look bad as evangelicals. Sure. And we just realized, you know, these apologists aren't going to get any better unless somebody produces a resource to help them. Yeah. And it's got to be people who are working in the field because text criticism is a really technical discipline so that even most New Testament scholars have trouble keeping up with it. Exactly. You know? And yeah. so we finally just realized like, hey, rather than just criticize apologists, what if we gave them something that told them the things not to do, but then on the other hand, told them the things they could say? you know, yeah. the things that are responsible. So that was really the impetus. Yeah. And so many Bible translators struggle to keep up with the field and, or have no experience in it at all. So, yep. yeah. Well, that leads me into this next 
part in your book, you quote Richard Porson, and he says, he does the best service to the truth who hinders it from being supported by falsehood. To use a weak argument in behalf of a good cause can only tend to infuse a suspicion of the cause itself into the minds of all who see the weakness of the argument, end quote. And this is so important, seeing this kind of stuff all over the place Mm -hmm. in evangelicalism. Could you give us like a a specific example, another specific example of truth being supported by falsehood in textual criticism? Yeah, so um, I love that quote. And Richard Porson was kind of a a pretty colorful character. He was a great classicist at Cambridge. Okay. Um, Yeah, a great example of that, I think, is there's a Dead Sea Scroll fragment that's Greek Mm. and there have been people who have tried to argue that that tiny fragment is a first century copy of Mark's gospel and virtually no new Testament scholar, certainly no papyrologist or text critic today thinks that's the case. There's too few letters in the, you've got to have a variant in one place to even make it work. And then it's just, there's just all kinds of problems with using it. But Mm. some popular apologists have even latched onto it as evidence for the reliability of, of the New Testament text. I see. Uh, and in some cases, the resurrection. So it's, wow. a gr- it's a good example of just where, you know, taking something that, okay, someone did argue this. Yes, they published a book about this, but most New Testament scholarship has raised serious problems with identifying this little fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls as a New Testament fragment. But it's a temptation for evangelicals to find any evidence that supports our faith and then present that as again almost a kind of a gotcha you know like see this is proof yeah and and as we say you know none of us is perfect all make mistakes i make mistakes in my own scholarship too and when Mm -hmm. people point that out i'm not fun but our goal is to truth as best we can right and so we ought to be some of the people who are most diligent about doing that and being the most careful about not misusing evidence to support our case i think yeah absolutely so and then the the second part of porson's quote of course is that the the more we do that the more we use evidence you know use bad arguments for a good cause it actually throws suspicion on the cause so this is what we saw in the apologetic literature was like elijah and i and our contributors agree that textual criticism is no reason to abandon the faith yeah i just think that's a really bad reason yeah. And there's really good reasons to trust the text of the New Testament. So we actually have a good argument we can make, but we make our case look worse because we use bad arguments to support it. Yeah. You know? If we could, let's talk a little bit about the chapter on myths about autographs in the book. I think this chapter is incredibly helpful to get people into the world of manuscripts and copying of the ancient world. So it's got stuff in it that I've never seen. And I love it. So could you share with us some of the accounts in that chapter that, that would help people understand the process of writing, editing, and copying in the ancient world? Yeah. So, you know, today we think of publishing a book and a person writes a book and it gets printed and every, every copy of the book has the same exact text, right? And uh, including the typos, sadly, <laughs> they, they, yeah. they make it at every printing, <laughs> at least before they're corrected, you know. But in the ancient world, publication worked a bit differently. And I think sometimes, uh, I know I thought this when I was in Bible college, I thought, you know, the autographs were like, you'd be able to identify them because they would have, they would be like glowing uh, Mm -hmm. and they maybe have like a halo around them. (laughs) And, And I just had this very, like this conception of inspiration where it was like, God spoke the exact words into Paul's ears and he wrote down everything he heard and nothing he didn't hear, you know? Yeah. And it was a very kind of mechanical view of inspiration. And so it can be really helpful actually to think about, well, what did, what did writing and publication look like in the ancient world? Yeah. And, uh, and so how, how should we expect that the new Testament writers did it? Because God, God didn't inspire them in some trance. He inspired the words that they wrote using their normal human faculties, right? And using the tools they had at hand. So they, they, they wrote on papyrus, they use ink and they use reed pens and all that. God didn't give them special instruments to do that. Yeah. Rather, he, he oversaw the process to make sure the result was what he wanted. And so thinking about that process, one of the things we realized is that it was not uncommon for writers in the ancient world to produce drafts so uh, one of the 
writer that we know from the ancient world who was very famous for his writing was Pliny the Younger, who lived in the first and into the second century, and he's, he's best known for his letters that he wrote to people. And he tells us at one point, he gives us a description of his writing process, and he talks about how he first revises his letters or his compositions in private, and then the next thing he tries to do is read them to two or three friends, and then he gives it to other people to annotate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if he still has doubts uh, about their corrections, their, their suggestions, then he weighs them against another friend or two. And the last thing he does is he recites what he's writing to a, a larger group. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that time, he says, at that point, he exercises his most rigid criticism of himself. And then it, when he's finally happy with it, then he sends it out to people and, and basically sends it out into the world to, to, to circulate. And mm-hmm. what Tim Mitchell does in this chapter is it shows how we have various examples from the ancient world where we can see that process of them editing and working. But once they get to the point of being ready to send it out in the world, that's kind of the point at which it's published and the author usually loses control of it at that point, right? Yeah. Because they send it out to one person, it gets copied, it gets copied and copied and copied. And once you've got five or six copies out in the wild, you can't fix all of them, even if you wanted to. Sure. So what he argues is that we should conceive of the New Testament autographs as essentially whatever the New Testament authors put out into the public sphere. Yeah. Um, and that may look different for the you know, Paul's letter to Romans than it does for the Gospel of Mark, Mm -hmm. but both of them must have at some point had, you know, been set out into the public, as it were. And um, and those were no longer draft versions, but those were what they wanted people to read, essentially. And from there, it's that point on, really, that textual criticism comes into play. Once people start copying those circulated public versions then as scribes start making mistakes, then text critics begin to have work to do. That's really helpful. Now in chapter 3 by Jacob Peterson, Mm -hmm. we learn that more manuscripts isn't always better. Right. Could you explain that briefly? Yeah, so there's a real temptation when we're talking about the Bible and wanting to defend it that we try to find the most number of manuscripts we can, the biggest number we can can find. So you'll find... You'll find some people saying, giving numbers as ridiculous as 24,000, saying we have 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, and we probably don't. We don't have near that many. But we still have a lot. But even though we have a lot, we should think carefully about whether we need a lot or not. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so more is not always better. And the obvious obvious way to think about this is if you have a 1,000 copies of a bad copy— Right, so let's say you have, you have one <laughs> yeah. bad copy and a thousand people copy it. They all copy it really well. They're still copying a bad copy, right? Yep. yep. So really, what's much more important than the number is the quality of manuscripts we have, mm-hmm. right? And so, as I like to remind my stu- students, I like to ask them, how many good manuscripts does it take to have a good text of the New Testament? Then the answer is, it really only takes one, you know. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, we have plenty of really good ones. So what Jacob's trying to do in that chapter is he's trying to do two things. One is he's trying to show why um, people sometimes, why it's easy to give a number that's too high. Mm -hmm. And that's basically because the people that keep the catalog, the official catalog of New Testament manuscripts, it's pretty, it's a pretty hard job to keep up with all of them. And a lot of things can go wrong in that process. For instance, manuscripts can get lost so we don't have access to them anymore. And then a, a common problem that we face in cataloging them is that manuscripts get broken up at some point in their history, mm-hmm. and they end up in different libraries. And so, you know, part of the manuscripts get dis- gets discovered in one decade and gets a catalog number, and then the other part gets cataloged a decade later and gets a different catalog number, even though they're oh, actually, boy. they were originally part of the same manuscript, right? <laughs> yeah. So that that can inflate the numbers. If you just look at the catalog, the catalog just kind of is a, is a running running uh, consecutive numbers, right? So manuscript one, two, three, and you just keep going. Well, that's great, but at some point you may figure out, oh, manuscript two and manuscript 25 are actually the same one. So if you just look at this official catalog and look for the highest number at the end of the catalog and say that's the total number, you're Uh in for a bit of a a mistake, right? And so he does some painstaking work in that chapter to show that probably a good good number to tell people is more in the range of 5,000 manuscript rather than something like 5,800 New right. Testament manuscripts, which is a number you'll often see in apologetic literature. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think that's one of the more, more common misconceptions, for sure. Mm-hmm. The other issue with yeah. that, 
it's not enough to just give the number, even if you even if you give a responsible number like five thousand or something mm-hmm. in that range. You always have to help people grasp that we're not talking about complete New Testament manuscripts in all mm-hmm. these cases. We're also not talking about early manuscripts in all these cases. The the majority of our manuscripts are from the ninth century and later. Um, okay. And very few, relatively speaking, very few of our manuscripts contain the whole New Testament. Only about 60 or so of our 5,000 New Testament manuscripts contain the whole New Testament. Okay. Much more common is that they contain part of it. So it's very right. common to copy the Gospels together, to copy Paul's letters together, and mm. then Acts and the Catholic uh, letters together. So, um, you know, for something like Revelation, we have probably less than a third of the total number of manuscripts that we have for the Gospels, because mm-hmm. the Gospels are just extraordinarily popular exactly. all through Christian history, right? So if you had the choice, and oftentimes people did have to choose because books were expensive to make, yep. people tended to choose a uh, a copy of the Gospels rather than Revelation. Gotcha. In chapter 4, then we have a presentation by James Prothro, who Mm -hmm. talks about comparing the New Testament to other ancient works, which is a common thing to do amongst apologetics, right? Very common, yeah. So what are some of the takeaways from this presentation? Yeah, so this is a really, really popular argument. You'll, you're, you'll be hard-pressed to find an apologetic discussion that does not at some point use this argument. And the reason is yeah. because it's a pretty powerful one. It can be, it's, or it certainly sounds really good. And the, the argument goes something like this. That if we compare the New Testament to other ancient literary works, the New Testament has far more manuscripts uh, that we can use to determine its text than anything else, right? And that's true. Um, right. The closest comparison is something like Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and we have, um, you know, a couple thousand manuscripts of those, which is far and away probably one of the best attested uh, pieces of yeah. literature from the ancient world. Okay, so compare that to 5,000 New Testament, and we ha- we're, we're doing a lot better with the New Testament. So the argument goes, we should be that much more confident in the New Testament text than we are for any other ancient document, yeah. Yeah. and... It's not like classicists throw up their hands and say, well, we can't know anything about the ancient world because we don't have enough manuscripts. Like, no, they, they work with what they have and they, they, they do their best and nobody says that we're going to just assume that Herodotus is wrong about everything because we don't have enough manuscripts for Herodotus' text, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the ancient historian. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good argument, especially if you're dealing with a skeptic who says, hey, we can't really know what the New Testament says because there's, there's too, many, too many variants and too many... Uh, variants in our manuscripts, you'd say, well, you know, if you're going to be skeptical about the New Testament, you should be even more skeptical about everything else from the ancient world. Sure. And since most skeptics don't want to go down that road, uh, it kind of it kind of forces the issue on them. So it's it's valuable yeah. for that, but it can be done in a in a really uh, in a couple bad ways. One is it can be done in such a way to make it sound like classical literature is poorly attested, uh-huh. and that's just not always true. Um, it can be especially bad when the comparison is an unfair one, and this happens a lot where apologists uh, use the biggest number they can find for the New Testament, and usually yep. they're much more familiar with that, right? So they can find mm-hmm. a, a very recent one, and it's a big one. But then they'll rely on F.F. Bruce, say, f- for classical works that they're comparing with. And the problem is Bruce's numbers are decades and decades out of date, right? Yeah. So it ends up being an unfair comparison where it's like we find the biggest number we can for the New Testament side, but then we don't bother to do our due diligence on the classical side of that, sure, right? Sure, yeah. Um, and then the other the other issue can be it's like, well, just because we have more manuscripts of the New Testament doesn't mean that it's that much better. Like the yeah. argument can't be a strictly um, it can't be a strictly strict comparison one because if more manuscripts means more reliable, well, does that mean the Gospels are three times more reliable than Revelation because we have three times more manuscripts of that? Right. You see? Yeah. So I like to use the example of Michael Jordan and LeBron James, right? Like, Michael Jordan is clearly the better basketball player, but that doesn't mean that LeBron James is bad. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so something can be better than something else without that other thing being bad. Yeah. So classical literature, some of it is very well attested, right? Sure. And we don't need that to be bad in order for the New Testament to be good, right? Gotcha. They can both be good. Yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. 
Now, Elijah Hickson, your co-editor, tackles a particularly important issue about dating manuscripts because, mm-hmm. uh, and, and this is, I think, a really fascinating topic, probably very mysterious in a lot of people's minds. How do people come up with dates for manuscripts? Could you give us an example of irresponsible dating and then how evangelical scholars can do better and maybe even touch on like how do people actually date manuscripts? Sure. Sure. So I'll, I'll start with that then and, and work, my, work yeah. the other direction if that's okay. We have various ways that we can try to date manuscripts. The best best way we have is if the scribe wrote at the end of the manuscript when he copied it. Um, yeah. And so these are what we call colophons, and they're little notes at the end, usually at the end of a manuscript, not always at the end, but usually, where the scribe says, you know, in such and such a year, I mm-hmm. so-and-so copied this manuscript, may the Lord bless those who read it, or something like that. Okay. Yeah. And um, and those are great. When we have those, we can sometimes, sometimes they'll even give us the day and the month, which is amazing. Mm. The, the problem is those are few and far between, sure. so most yeah. of our manuscripts don't have that. Another way we can sometimes date is if we know where the manuscript was found, we can we can do something similar to what they do with archaeology and look at where it was found or what it was found with, mm-hmm. and that can sometimes be helpful in dating a manuscript. Mm-hmm. But again, that one's um, that doesn't happen real often. Yeah. And so the most common way, and still in many ways the best way, is we use the style of handwriting, mm-hmm. and it's not a perfect science, but it is it is generally reliable. And that is we we can we can chart the change in handwriting, and you can do this even with English handwriting. If you were to see George mm-hmm. Washington's handwriting, you would immediately know that was not written in the year two thousand twenty, right? <laughs> um, and so, even if you were to look at a letter written in nineteen twenty, so only a hundred years ago, you would be able to tell that that's old. You might not know how old exactly, but if you became an expert and studied a lot of handwriting. In yeah. English, you could eventually begin to chart the change in handwriting over time. Sure. And any time you had something that was dated from that time in handwriting, you'd have like a, a hook that you could hang your mm-hmm. timeline on, right? So that's what we try to do with with manuscripts. It's called paleography. It's the study of ancient handwriting. And we try whenever we can to find a dated manuscript and use that as a hook. And then we mm-hmm. try to fit things between that and watch how the handwriting develops over time. The cool. issue with it is it doesn't give us a precise date, and yeah. that's where the problems start sometimes for apologists. Usually, paleographers, good paleographers, do not want to give a more precise date than 50 years, right. a 50-year 50 span. And that's because that's kind of the general lifespan of a scribe, and so you kind of think of the handwriting lasting at least a generation. It takes a full generation before it begins to really change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's the idea. Okay. Sometimes they'll even be more careful and want to limit it to a hundred year span, depending okay. on the style, of the handwriting, and, and and where they're at on the timeline and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So the problem becomes when in the literature, in the in the technical literature, they will often give a century. They'll say like third century, right? Or they'll give a span two fifty to three hundred. And sometimes what can happen is that gets simplified, oversimplified to whatever the middle date is between that between those two boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. And that then becomes the number that sticks in people's mind and people begin to think, get the wrong impression that it was copied on that exact date. So a common one is P52, which probably is our earliest or one of our earliest New Testament manuscripts, and it's often dated to the first century. Okay. But you'll sometimes see it as dated from 100 to 150, and then from there it gets dated to 125, and then people begin to think, well, that is the date that it was copied. And then they try to count back from that to when John's gospel might have been written. And they say things like, well, it was written within 35 years of when John's gospel was penned. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. And we then fall into the trap of giving an overly precise date to yeah. it. And in yeah. the worst case scenarios, as Christians, we basically just find whatever the earliest date is that we can find mm-hmm. <laughs> for these early manuscripts and only cite that, yeah. where what we really need to be doing is being re- more responsible and saying, well, no, it could be at least a 50-year gap, and sometimes mm-hmm. even more, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's the gist of that chapter. Yeah, by the way, my, my wife made a replica of P-52 on papyrus, oh, yeah. got it framed in the living room. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. That's That's really helpful. So, yeah, evangelical scholars can do better by being a little less specific, I guess, yeah, mm-hmm. with their, their dating. 
and part of it is is Andrew just a broader trying yeah. to avoid the need always for the earliest sure right? sure and yeah. just being honest and and, and not trying to the, the danger is that we build our faith on shaky ground right yeah so yeah great examples is the first century mark fragment that was announced years ago and only published in the last couple of years and christian apologists went on the speaking circuit and started saying hey this is such strong evidence for the reliability of mark's gospel and therefore for the resurrection of jesus and the problem was when the when the fragment finally got published it was published as second or third century mm. by the scholars who edited it so does that mean the resurrection is less certain for us now than it was two right. years ago when we thought it was first century well i think the answer should be no yeah. right yeah. but that should then give us caution before building too much on too little mm-hmm. yeah that's really good now speaking of manuscripts and scribes a common myth is that the majority of scribes were careless amateurs in the early centuries. Uh, Zachary Cole has a chapter about that. Is that true, and how can we tell? Yeah. So it is true that in some cases our early scribes are not great. We can look at a manuscript like P72, which is has a number of notable variants that only that manuscript has. And that's uh-huh. one way we can try to gain some measure of the quality of a scribe's work as we look at what are called singular readings or the readings that are only found in that one manuscript. Mm. And the logic with that is if these readings are only found in this manuscript, they are probably the creation of this scribe or at least the scribe right before him or right before him. So they're probably yeah. not, they probably were never very widespread is the, is the idea, right? Okay. So they're probably not original and that mm. means they were made by a scribe and thus their mistakes at yeah. some level. So a, a manuscript like P72 is not not overall great. He shows a high number, but the confusion that's happened in some of the literature is a confusion between the quality of the writing Mm -hmm. and then the quality of the text that's being written. Mm -hmm. And so a mistake that's been made is assuming that because a manuscript, say an early manuscript, has a bit of a rough handwriting style, that therefore it must have been done by an unprofessional scribe. And that's just not always true. Sometimes very professional scribes didn't have the the best or most careful handwriting, but that's not the same thing as saying that they were bad copyists. Sure. And so that's kind of the the issue that uh, Zach Cole takes on in his chapter and tries to lay out. Hey, no, we actually have, we have manuscripts from the early period that, based on comparison with other manuscripts, they show themselves to be very well copied, even in some cases where the script is not what we might say very elegant. Yeah, yeah. Real quick, we know that scribes made corrections and mistakes, obviously, and could you give uh, an interesting example of each, like a specific example of, of corrections and mistakes? Sure. So we might talk about this in a bit, but in Luke uh, twenty-three thirty-four, that is Jesus' prayer from the cross. Yeah. Where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, in, in several very important manuscripts, that prayer is not found. So our earliest copy of Luke's Gospel, P75, mm-hmm. doesn't have that prayer. Uh, neither does Codex Vaticanus, which is closely related to P75 and Luke. Mm. Codex Sinaiticus, which is the same same date range as Codex Vaticanus in the 4th century, has the prayer in the first hand. So the first the scribe that copied it out put it in, included it. Then a corrector came along and removed it. <laughs> marked it for removal, and then a third scribe came along later and tried to undo the removal. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so you can see you can see how these some of these manuscripts, especially our big ones, were often used for centuries. And just like you know, if you only had one one Bible that yeah. you could use, you would want it to be as correct as you could. But if you were familiar with the Bible from say the liturgy in your church. You might read that Bible, that one copy that you had, and say, "No, no, that's not right," because I know how we say it in the liturgy. Okay, you know, and so um, scribes could be interested in correcting a manuscript, and um, and it's an interesting fact because it shows us corrections show us two things: it shows us that scribes did make mistakes and that they were able to correct them. Yeah, and sometimes the impression given about the transmission of the New Testament text is that it's an unending process of greater and greater corruption. Mm-hmm. So the analogy that's sometimes given in, in popular discussions is it's like the telephone game yeah. where, you know, you tell somebody some silly statement, the next person says it to the next person on and on, and by the end it's it's not even recognizable, and that's the fun of the game, right? That's the whole point. Well, the New Testament is not like that because at each point of copying, at each point of transmission, there was also opportunity to correct, Yeah. right? 
and we can see all over the place in manuscripts the scribes did that. Sometimes they did it poorly, for sure. You know, sometimes they miscorrected, just like they miscopied. Yep. But the point is, it's not it's not so simple as to just say it's a kind of a straight line of greater and greater corruption. That's just simply not true. Yeah, exactly. Fascinating. I did want to talk more about Luke twenty three thirty four. Mm-hmm. That's in your chapter in the book, and it's it's a fascinating and surprising issue. Actually, I wasn't very familiar with because I, I focus so much more on Old Testament textual criticism. And uh, I was wondering if you could walk us through a little more of that issue. And then what is your personal conclusion on whether that text should be included or not? Yeah. So the issue, as I mentioned, is the prayer from the cross. Father, forgive them for the new, not what they do. And <clears throat> the issue is that it's not found in some really early important manuscripts like P75 and Codex Vaticanus. Um, it's not found in the Latin text of Codex Bezae, which is 5th century, mm-hmm. uh, and then several other manuscripts like Codex W, or in some of the earliest Syriac, Latin, and Coptic translations as well. Mm-hmm. Having said that, it is in the vast majority of manuscripts, but keep in mind the vast majority of manuscripts are later, so they okay. don't weigh as heavily in this. And the simple question that we have to ask in text criticism is, which which reading best explains the other one, right? So is yep. it more likely that someone removed a prayer that was originally there in Luke's gospel, or is it more likely that somebody added it to a gospel that didn't have it? Yeah. And here's where we have to start thinking about some other bits of evidence that we have. Irenaeus is aware of the prayer already in the second century, hmm. so we know it goes back very early. Okay. There's a very similar prayer on the lips of Stephen in the book of Acts, Mm. but it's not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So some people have speculated that, well, maybe this prayer was added to Luke because they were reading Acts, and they said, well, this is such an incredible prayer from Stephen, and Stephen can't outdo Jesus, so let's put a similar prayer on the lips of Jesus. (laughs) Um, It's a bit speculative, and, and the bigger problem in my mind with that explanation is that if that were the case, we'd probably expect the prayers to to line up more in terms of their wording, okay. and they're not quite exact. Yeah, that's the, the, the prayer is stable in the text and Acts, but it, they're not the same, so I don't think that's quite c- compelling enough. There's another potential option, that is there's a second century church father named Hegesippus, who mm-hmm. we learn about in Eusebius' uh, church history in the 4th century, and he tells us that James, the brother of Jesus, prayed a very similar prayer at his martyrdom. Okay. Mm. And so some have suspected that maybe it came from, from that source. Again, we have this, a, a bit of a problem, though, with circularity, and that is it could just as easily have been the other direction, right? Gotcha. It could be the prayer in, uh, in Hegesippus that he says James prayed came from Jesus, right? Or came from Luke, okay? okay. Or both, obviously, okay? So, you know, that's a bit tricky. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the best argument in favor that the prayer is original is that is that we know that some early Christian writers were disturbed by the prayer, which is surprising to most modern oh, really? readers. Because, yeah, wow. most of us love this prayer, and yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. But there were, there were early Christian writers who were somewhat disturbed by it, and they could be huh. for a number of reasons. One is that uh, at times they were, they, were, um, they were fighting with Jews at the time, and as we know, some of, them, some of the early Christian writers were, could be quite anti-Semitic, and so they did not like the fact that Jesus was praying for God oh, to forgive the Jews who killed him, yeah. right? Okay, so there could be a bit of anti-Semitism involved there. Uh, another issue, though, and probably the more significant one, is that some read the prayer as not having been fulfilled. Mm. So Jesus prays from the cross, Father, forgive them. Mm, but mm. then in AD 70, their view was that God had judged the Jewish people for crucifying Jesus with the destruction of Jerusalem, right. Right? using the Romans, of course. But, but God working through the Romans, judging Israel for their unbelief. And so their feeling yeah. was, how could Jesus pray this prayer to God, his Father, who he has such a close relationship with, and then yeah. he not answer it? Exactly. Right? Yeah. So there were some theological um problems with it. So huh. probably the best argument in favor of the prayer being original is that it was removed uh, s- somewhere early on by a scribe or by a reader who felt that it was too theologically problematic. I they see. removed it for that reason. Huh. On the other side of the ledger, okay, thinking the other direction now, the argument is that the prayer, no, the prayer is just too wonderful. No one would ever remove it. 
and that the way they would deal with uh, these theological problems is the way, the way they dealt with other theological problems they encountered in the Bible, which right. is they would write commentaries on them and try to resolve the issue through mm-hmm. commentary rather than through excising difficult passages or verses, right? Sure, yeah. Um, so that that's that. At the, at the end of the day, I'm still torn, and that's one of the reasons why I use it as an example, is yeah. to show there are some really significant we could call them precious, I mean, verses that we love mm-hmm. that are textually suspect or at least difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of the day, I'm still torn. I Since I wrote the book, I lean slightly more toward including it than I did when I wrote the chapter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and that's partly because the prayer actually fits really well with Luke's one of Luke's themes, which is a theme of ignorance. We okay. find it in Acts as well, huh. where people are... Where, where, like in Stephen's prayer, they're offered forgiveness because they did not recognize the significance of crucifying Jesus. Hmm. And it's not to say that their ignorance excuses them. It doesn't. If, if it excused them, Jesus wouldn't need to say forgive them, right? You don't usually yeah. get for, forgiven for things you're innocent of. Rather, the ignorance motif in Luke is to say people did things to Jesus that they didn't realize how significant their actions were because mm-hmm. they didn't realize how significant Jesus was. Yeah, right. They didn't realize yeah. who they were doing it to. And especially in light of the resurrection, one of Luke's major points in his two-volume work is to show that God vindicates who Jesus said he was through the resurrection. Yeah. And therefore, the claims that he was a false messiah or an insurrectionist are flat-out wrong. And God's sure. shown us that through the resurrection. So yeah. the other reason it's a good example, Andrew, is because at the end of the day, even though that's a really precious verse, to many of us, mm-hmm. and for good reason, it doesn't call into question the ethic of Jesus that we ought to forgive our enemies. Right. Right? Yeah. So we find that in several other places in the Gospels, and then we see it again with Acts, and we actually see this same ethical principle later in what, what are called the Apostolic Fathers. They talk about this as well. So it's really clear from other places in the New Testament that Jesus expects his followers to forgive their enemies. Mm-hmm. And so whether or not Jesus did it from the cross or not, there's no doubt that he uh, told us to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So we That's should good. not think that this difficult choice, difficult though it is, and as significant as that verse is, we should not think that it's a choice between whether or not the New Testament teaches Christians to forgive their enemies. Sure, yeah. As with most textual issues, right? There's always right. somewhere else that you can get that doctrine, like the Trinity and other yeah. things. Yeah, that's right. Now, I haven't looked recently in English Bibles. Luke twenty three thirty four is that mm-hmm. footnoted? Um, it usually is. It is. I don't okay. Have to check, you know, to say exactly which ones do, but I think that usually it is. I don't know of an English translation that leaves it out. Right, um, of course. And you can probably imagine why. Yeah. Right. And frankly, I wouldn't either. Given my own doubts, I would never leave it out, sure, given my sure. doubts. I'd have to be much more confident myself that it doesn't belong before I would be willing to take it out. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> so a typical so. footnote would say some early manuscripts do not include this verse or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The other, wish, the other issue I didn't mention about it briefly is it's a bit of an abrupt interruption there. Without that prayer, oh, right. the text flows nicely with the subject from the soldiers who are dividing his clothes. Yeah. And um, so that's some evidence that maybe it didn't didn't belong. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, I think, yeah, I think most modern English translations will include it, but put a footnote saying some manuscripts omit the sentence. Gotcha. Why do you think elements of textual criticism aren't taught in church Sunday school, even though English Bibles are so full of footnotes that make no sense if you haven't gotten the basics (laughs) of textual criticism? Yeah. Um, That's a great question. I think probably a couple reasons. One is it's technical, so pastors sometimes have a hard time with it. Yeah. Um, And then probably a bad reason is that sometimes pastors are afraid to even broach it with their people. Right. and that may th- those two reasons may go hand in hand sometimes, right? They don't know enough about it themselves, and so they're hesitant to bring it up because they'll, you know, create too many questions in people's minds that they are not equipped to answer. Yeah. So that's that's honestly probably the main reason. What um, about at your church? Do you get to teach any anything like this at Sunday school or whatever? Yeah. So I teach a Sunday school class. Cool. Um, 
probably most people will be surprised how little I talk about text criticism. Although, okay. you know, given how much I enjoy it, <laughs> okay. it doesn't doesn't actually come up that often. But when I I try to discuss it when I come across something that, where there is a footnote in their English Bible, so I find that a good way to a good time to talk about things that are more technical is where an English Bible has a footnote about it, and people yeah. might have a question, or maybe in a case where I know people in my church are some are using NIV, some are using ESV, and I know there's going to be a difference. Yeah, uh, and it's it's more than just superficial. Mm-hmm. That might be a good occasion for me to uh, bring textual criticism into the picture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. I try, as a general principle, I try not to... There's a bit of an issue, right, in that the people I'm teaching don't have any way to really check me once I start getting technical with them. <laughs> so as soon as I start mentioning a Greek word or Greek manuscripts, yeah. they don't have any way to check me. Sure. Um, but with their English Bible, that's always something they can check me on, right? Yep. Yep. And so as much as I can in my teaching and preaching, I try to use their English our English Bibles as, as our touch point. Mm-hmm. in discussions so that they can feel confident not just in their bible but frankly in my teaching because they can check me on it right yeah um the minute i start referring to greek and hebrew i become like the wizard of oz behind the curtain you know? <laughs> and uh <laughs> and yep. they'd have to learn greek to be able to pull that curtain back so it's not it's not always fair to do that you have to just be wise as a teacher as a pastor to know when when to sure. do that obviously i'm not saying to never do it yeah uh, sometimes you really do need to so but the cool. one thing that we do is um my co-director at the Texan Canon Institute, John Mead, and I, we do a traveling conference for churches designed specifically for lay people on how we got the Bible. Oh, great. And uh, if your listeners are interested, they can go to scribesandscriptures.com okay. and learn about it. We do anywhere from two to four talks, uh-huh. anywhere from one to two days, and we cover everything from the text of the Old Testament, text of the New Testament, how we got the books of the Bible, so the question of canon, yeah. and then we do a lecture on Bible translation, so giving people a, an overview of that process of how we got the Bible. So Fantastic. that's just one way that we try to kind of plug that gap. Yeah. And then the other thing that's I great. can mention is before COVID happened, we did a big conference here in Phoenix called the Sacred Words Conference Yeah. and uh, brought in guest speakers like Dan Wallace and Peter Gentry. And the videos for all that is on our YouTube channel. Right. So if I'll people are interested in that, they can mm-hmm. go to YouTube and search for Texan Canon Institute, and, and we'll come up and they can get those. Sweet. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. This has been so helpful, and I hope everyone who's listening has gotten a lot out of this, and you'll get a lot more if you get the book and uh, encourage you to pick up a copy. I think it's pretty approachable, even if, you're new to this subject or if you don't know greek there's still a lot you can you can glean from it so check that out do you guys have any um plans to publish anything more on the lay level uh we do so uh john mead and i are actually working on a book proposal right now that that will be a um lay level introduction to how we got the bible so taking the material we've been doing in churches through scribes and scripture and then putting that packaging that in a book form so stay tuned great Once again, I'm so grateful that you would spend some time hanging out at this podcast. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.